Hi guys. Today I want to just go over a little bit of a, a media review. Um, now, as mentioned in the course intro, it's really going to be up to you what color media you use. And um, as I also said, uh, you know, I use almost all sorts of media, even non-traditional media, when it comes to my fashion sketches. So I'll do one fashion sketch and I might use many different types of media um, all over the board. Uh, this is not my setup, I wish it was. <laughs> not quite as well supplied um, or as organized, really, um, with my media. But, I, you know, doing one fashion sketch, I might use paint, I might use pencil, I might use marker, I might use whiteout, I might you know, use nail polish, all in one sketch. Um, so, you know, it's going to be really up to you to explore and try different media and, and see what works for you. So I want to just briefly go over, you know, some of the most common media that we will be using, um, or not even that we will be using, because again, you're never required to use any specific media if you don't want to, um, but just some of the most common media found in fashion sketching, um, just so you can sort of think about how to resupply. And again, most of this you should already have carried over from FD11. Um, but you know, in case you, know, you lost that pack of colored pencils or some of your markers went dry, um, <laughs> time to restock. So uh, let's take a look at this. So our first stop is gonna be colored pencils. Um, this is pretty much where a lot of students like to start because they're easy to use, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, they're really great for sharp detail because we have that nice fine point. Um, they have some light on top of dark capability and what I mean by that is you're able to draw light colors on top of dark colors, um, which we run into a lot in fashion illustration. Um, so a lot of the media I use will be really dependent on, again, the fabric that I'm using and if it will stand out well on top of a dark fabric. And this is relevant in doing details on dark fabric, um, doing prints, we'll see that later on with paints, which is really the, um, you know, the, the gold standard and being able to do light colors on top of dark colors. Um, but it has some of that capability. And it's easy to vary color intensity. So what I mean by that is, depending on how hard you're pushing down on the pencil, you can get a sort of darker, more vibrant color, and then kind of ease up to sort of fade away. So you get this kind of nice fading, um, which is really great for shading. It's really great for doing shiny fabrics. It's really great for sheer fabrics, um, so on and so forth. What are the cons? It's really hard to match your colors because unless you have a colored pencil that is exactly the color of your color swatch, um, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, so you're going to have to have a ton of these things and you're going to be rifling through potentially hundreds of different colored pencils looking for that exact color match um, because again, it's, it's very hard to sort of mix and, and tweak the colors that are already there in the pencil. Um, and again, color matching is something that we do a lot. It's very important that we match the colors of our swatches as closely as we can to our sketches because our sketches are supposed to be uh, representing the reality of what's going to be. And if they don't match the color of the fabric swatch, well, they're not doing a good job. Um, with color pencils too, a lot of times the color tone is uneven and fuzzy. Um, and this is not necessarily a con when used properly. Um, as you can see when we move to the next slide, it's actually one of the advantages. Where it is a con is where students are a little bit over-reliant and only used color pencils. Um, and also because they sort of attract the beginner sketching, the beginner sketcher and maybe not the more skilled sketcher, they're not, uh, people who use it tend to be not really well versed in how to really, really use it very well. And where this gets into a trouble is, um, you know, students will use it for skin tone or they'll not use it properly. And what happens is the color looks fuzzy, it looks uneven, um, and that again, can be beneficial if that's what you're trying to capture, but in things like skin tone or solid color fabrics or things that are really solid, even, and bright, it's a very big con, um, and it will look kind of weird, um, so on. So be careful. Make sure that you're getting a nice, even color tone if that's um, where you need it. 
Also, con is it's very time consuming in large areas of color because you have a very small sort of tip. Um, coloring in uh, large areas can take a lot of time. And especially, again, if you need a bright solid color, I, I certainly don't recommend them at all for a bright solid color, and even less so in a large area, because you're just going to be doing it forever. <laughs> so where will you use it? Um, textured fabrics, it's really great. Again, those little sharp points are great for sharp fabrics. And that fuzzy, uneven color tone works really great for fabrics that are fuzzy and have an uneven color tone. So um, things like this tweed over here or this merled knit where you kind of fade in between. You get this sort of staticky, fuzzy feeling to the color. Um, you lightly blend over your colored pencils to get this kind of fuzzy, um, uh, uneven color tone. It works really great for that. Also things like fur. Uh, where you're getting these sort of under um, tones with a lighter on top, so and you, that little streaking, those um, little sharp nibs. Um, again, it's sort of a fuzzy color tone, but those sharp nibs are really great for getting that texture work. Um, and also things like mesh. So, um, you know, it's, it's again sort of a fuzzy color that you're getting with this. Um, and by sort of scratching in some texture, some people like to even sort of rub a colored pencil over a piece of that fabric to get that texture. It's also really great in prints. Uh, again, those little sharp nibs are great for small detail. Um, so really, really great for prints and all of these different types of fabrics. Definitely recommend. Another favorite from students are markers. Uh, markers because again just like colored pencils they are easy to use um, they're great because they have a rich and even color tone so you're not getting any of that fuzziness that you're getting with colored pencils uh, layering coffer colors offers some mixing so it has a little bit better of a uh, color matching ability than our colored pencils because I can go down with one layer of a color and then go over with another and blend it a little bit to make a new color. So I have a little bit more flexibility. I don't necessarily absolutely have to have a marker that matches my uh, swatch. I have a little bit of wiggle room. Um, and it's really, especially these broad tip ones are great for large areas of color. Now a lot of markers will come with different size nibs. When some will have a big flat nib for large areas, um, and the other end will be a little small nib for sharper detail, or you can just simply get fat nibs and, and small nibs, um, and depending on what you want to do. Um, again, those smaller nibs are great for smaller detail, like prints and things like that. Those fat nibs are really great um, for larger areas of color. What are the cons? They're super expensive. Oh my goodness, they're very, very expensive. They can also dry out very, very quickly. Um, so a, a little tip for that is if you soak your nib in some isopropyl alcohol, um, you can go ahead and uh, eke out a little bit more. So what will happen is that sort of juice in the marker that makes it flow is, is kind of like alcohol. That's, that's why they smell weird. Um, and isopropyl alcohol can be used as a sort of stand-in for that. So a lot of times the markers died out, it's not because they're out of pigment, it's because they're out of that kind of liquid element. Um, again, because, especially because alcohol and the, that sort of solution that's in there evaporates really, really quickly. So if you soak the nib in uh, isopropyl alcohol for a little while, what it'll do is the um, sort of sponginess of the nib will soak up the alcohol, kind of re-wet itself, and you'll get a little bit more light, uh, life out of it. Can't do it indefinitely, um, and it is still a con. It can also streak. Um, so this may mean that you might have to go over areas or be careful. Again, when used correctly and with skill, the streaking can actually be a benefit because you can use it to shade or kind of blend. Um, but without that skill, it can be quite annoying and you kind of have to go over areas a couple times uh, to eliminate the streaking. Um, they also can bleed, and depending on the brand, can bleed more or less. These chart pack here, um, even though I absolutely love, love, love chart packs, they bleed, um, which means the area that you color in will slowly expand over time. Um, you know, not indefinitely to a certain point, but um, you kind of have to be careful. So if you don't want your color past a certain point, 
you have to be quite careful to maybe leave a little bit of space between that last line and where you put down your marker. Um, and again, this varies by brand. Some brands don't bleed as much. If your marker is drying out, it won't bleed as much, although it will streak more. Um, and it's also, it's hard to vary the color intensity. So um, whereas in uh, colored pencils, we can make a lighter color just by easing up our, our pressure of our hand. Uh, this is one shot. Um, we can sort of fade and do shading uh, with gray markers. Um, and I'm actually gonna uh, take a minute because I, I didn't really talk about shading. Um, I always, always shade with marker. Um, I like it almost always, depending on what I'm going over. But um, I really love to do all my shading with uh, markers. Um, it's really quick, it's really easy. They come in different um, gradations from one to, they're probably back here, um, one to usually nine or 10 or, or whatever. Um, and that's different darknesses of gray. The smoothness and the evenness of the tone I think makes really good for shading. So where are you gonna use your markers? For bright colored fabric, fabrics, for solid color fabrics, for solid ground colors for prints. So that means, you know, for the background of this, I would use a marker. Um, for skin tone, and I didn't use this um, for shading, yeah, but I definitely recommend it for shading. You can use pencil too, but um, um, you know, whatever works for you, but I, I find it works really well for skin tone. It works really well for uh, shading as well. Watercolor pencils. <clears throat> now, um, a lot of students don't even know that this is an option because they're a little bit more rare um, and they're a little bit odd. Um, so they're kind of a mix between your paints and your colored pencils. Um, and what the difference is, is these are special colored pencils. They look like just your regular colored pencils, um, but you can then go over it with just a wet brush, wet with water. Um, and sort of blend it in. And if you look really closely here, it's showing you the difference. So you can really see what I'm talking about, that sort of fuzzy quality. You're getting a lot of the whiteness of the page in here. It's not a smooth, rich, even color. It's fuzzy, which again, might be what you want. But with the watercolored pencils, if that's not what you want, what you can do is you can go over it with just, again, a, a, a brush with a little bit of a uh, water on it and smooth out that color. So we can see in these wet examples, the color is a lot more even. We're not getting that whiteness of the page coming through. It's a lot more sort of even and bright and, and vibrant. It also gives you a really lovely painterly quality without having to deal with paints or knowing how to paint. It also has better mixing uh, uh, potential than colored pencils because again, you do have this sort of liquid um, it's great for fades, for ombres, um, for blending, things like that. So, um, you know, I, I actually really, really love watercolor pencils because it, it's kind of almost like a hack. Um, uh, you get all the qualities of your colored pencils and you get all of the, most all of the qualities of uh, paints kind of in one version. So what are their cons? Well, they're a lot more expensive than your regular colored pencils. Um, you also need an extra step when sketching. So not only do you need to draw it out, but then you need to, depending on what you're doing, go over it with that wet brush as well. So that extra step can be a little bit more time consuming. Um, it is not as great with color mixing than paint, although it is better than regular colored pencils. So it's somewhere in the middle there. It's also not as great at light over dark coloring than paint. So it's not gonna, like if I wanted to do a you know, that bright yellow over top that dark blue, it's not gonna work that well. Not as good as paint. So where are you gonna use it? Well, everywhere a colored pencil can be used, obviously, and almost everywhere paint can be used. So a lot of versatility with this media. It's also really great at sheer, and again, ombre, um, and, and that sort of uh, uh, shiny fabrics, very versatile. Gouache paints. Now, a lot of you have not used gouache paints, and um, it looks like I spelled them wrong. There's a couple ways of selling it. Um, you know, I always underestimate how many vowels they pack into the word gouache, um, but I really like gouache paints, and they're very, very favored by a lot of illustrators. 
and a lot of people are kind of scared about gouache paints because um, paints are a little less user friendly um, you know they're not as accessible to the beginning user as uh, a uh, colored pencils or marker is because at some point in, in everybody's life we've used colored pencils or markers you know um, but not everyone's used paint um, but they have a lot of really really great qualities they're fantastic at blending so much more so than anything we've gone over so far so um, although paints themselves can be kind of on the expensive side and also you need to buy brushes and you have to kind of maintain the brushes which again that's sort of a con it's it's messy that's my first con it's messy and there's kind of a lot of extra steps you got to get the palette you got to get the brushes you got to have a water dish you got to clean the brushes and you got to clean your palettes and and it's it's a bit of a hassle i'm not gonna lie um, so I do avoid using gouache unless I really need to, but when I do, I'm glad that I did. Um, why? Well, although you do need sort of all these things, um, your palettes and your stuff are not that expensive, but, you know, a simple palette like this, or even less, I could take out a lot of these colors here, even though the tubes themselves might be a little bit expensive, it's not like colored pencils or markers where I only, I have to find... Uh, something close. Um, essentially, if I have black, white, yellow, blue, and um, red, I can make any color that I want. So you can mix paints into any color that you want. So you have, um, this is by far the gold standard for matching colors. Um, you're going to find nothing better. Um, so while it does seem a bit expensive, where you have to buy like, you know, colored pencils might not be that expensive, but when you have to buy like a hundred to make sure that you always have the right color and you only have to buy, you know, um, essentially five big tubes, your white, your black, your blue, your red, your orange, I'm sorry, your, your blue, your red, your yellow, um, and then mix from there, um, it starts to become more economical to do um, gouache paints. And gouache paints, as paints go are are on the inexpensive side they're not as expensive as oils or anything like that um, the other thing that they're really great at is you can do light over dark um, and I'll show you that uh, an example of that in our next slide um, and another couple cons for them uh, again a little bit harder to use we went over that um, other two cons is you got to wait for it to dry um, and a lot of times that'll be between steps so you'll do different layers of your gouache and you got to wait um, to dry it every time um, it's a little annoying makes it a little bit longer um, it is less annoying if you have a hair dryer handy uh, do throw a layer on there and blast it with your hair dryer and it'll be dry in no time Gouache is a fairly fast drying paint, especially when compared to something like oils. Um, and that's why illustrators use it, is it is fast drying. But whereas you compare it to something like colored pencils, which are dry instantly, or markers, which are, you know, maybe take a couple seconds to dry, it will take a little bit longer. Um, the other con is colors can be slightly different once dry. So if you are mixing, you kind of have to um, do a little swatch, test out your color, and let it dry to see if it is the, uh, uh, the right color. And I found this particularly so for purples. I'm not sure why. Um, purples will just almost always be just a little bit darker wet and a little bit drier, um, a little bit lighter dry. Don't know why, um, but that's just what I've seen from experience. So be careful. When to use gouache paints. So gouache paints are really great um, because they're water soluble. Um, and you might ask me, Kate, what's the difference between our watercolors and gouache paints? Well, watercolors, um, they're both water soluble, um, but with gouache paints, they don't typically come in cakes. They come in tubes and are already in kind of a liquidy, paintable form. Um, so if you don't add water, they are opaque or you cannot see through them. So they have the same benefits as um, markers, whereas you get this beautiful, bright, even um, color tone. Don't have to worry about streaking, 
don't have to worry about fuzziness. It's just bright, it's solid, and it's and it's gonna go over whatever you need to go over. Um, however, if you add a little bit of water to it or even more water to it, depending on how much water you add to it, you can start to get um, a sheer, more watercolor-like um, paint. And you can even you know, start with no water and just with another brush, add a little bit of water and fade it and blend it and get that sort of um, uh, um, light to dark um, color that you can get with the watercolor pencils. So it's really great, it's really, really great for sheer fabrics because it has that versatility. You can make it sheer, or as sheer as you want, really. It can be incredibly sheer or it can be incredibly solid. It's very good for prints. Um, and again, depending on if you're doing larger areas, you're gonna want just a larger brush. Um, or if you're doing fine areas, you just get a detail brush. So versatile in that. Really great for ombres and blending colors together. Uh, base colored for textured fabrics. And again, one of the best, best uses for paints is doing light color over dark. So um, with no other medium, except for digital medium, um, could I get these light, light yellow polka dots over a dark background? If I was to do this all in marker, what I'd have to do is go and place um, black all the way around each polka dot and leave this white, We leave this paper here. That takes forever. So what I would do if I wanted to render this is just do the whole thing black and then get a tube of yellow gouache paint and then put in the dots. Those dots will be as bright yellow and vibrant um, as if I left that paper right beca white because again, it has really, really, really great light over dark capa um, capabilities, which none of the other um, uh, media, they might have some, but not as good. Black ink pens. This you should have no matter what. Um, they're great for outlines, they're good for details, and um, you get a pack like this and it offers a variety for different line qualities. And we'll talk a little bit about line qualities after this um, presentation. So um, again, there's not much difference to this. I don't really, uh, you know, if you're doing like black laces and stuff like that, um, fine. I use these guys mostly just for outlining details. Um, out, you know, eyes, lips, outline the figure, outline, you know, you got a, some buttons, you got a zipper, you got some pocket lines. Um, so all the details of your garments I tend to do in black ink pens. Cons, don't make a mistake because you can't erase it. Again, when do you use it? For outlining figures and details in, in your clothing. So I picked pick this because it's got some really nice line quality to it. Um, so very dramatic. It really makes your figure pop out from the page. So not are we seeing it, not only are we seeing it as an outline, um, you know, defining the drapes, defining the outlines, making it stand out from the background, but we see it being used, you know, buttons and, you know, where the, uh, the button, button placket closure comes, uh, seeming details, and so on and so forth. White charcoal pencil. Now this might be another one that you don't think about, but it's always handy to have, or at least I found it pretty handy to have. Um, for specific um, areas where you need a light over dark, uh, don't want to mess with your paints and need to, it to be in a fine detail. Um, that's really what I use it for. A few other things are great for highlights, are good for shines, are good for some texturing. Um, cons, it's only somewhat better than a white colored pencil. So if you don't want to go out and get a whole nother thing, they're not very expensive. Just a one charcoal pencil is not very expensive. So if you want to experiment, go ahead. But if you got a white colored pencil, eh, you're probably good with that. So when to use it? Details on dark fabric. So the same thing, uh, same places where you would use a black um, pen ink. So um, in that illustration before, I was showing you they were doing seaming detail, they were doing uh, buttons, things like that with a black ink pen. However, what if you got a black garment or a really dark, a dark navy or you know whatever dark colors? Your black ink pen is not going to show up. So in comes the white charcoal pencil. You can do all of those same garment details with a nice white charcoal pencil. You can also do it with a white colored pencil too if you want. 
Um, I find, again, the white charcoal pencil stands out on top of dark media a little bit better. It's also really good in, in texturing fabrics like um, denim. I use it a lot in denim, so I'll put down a, uh, you know, indigo base. And then um, denim typically has a lot of sort of lighter striations and uh, sort of these white lines that sort of pop in and uh, sometimes diagonal if it's done twin twill, which it usually is. And I'll use a white charcoal pencil to kind of scratch in some of that texture. It's also really great for highlights and shine. So if you want to add like a little bit of shine or a little bit of highlight here, um, it's, it's great for that. Digital media. So more and more, uh, my students are preferring, um, you know, it's, it's still in the minority, but those of you who want to use digital media, you're absolutely allowed to in this class. Um, what are the pros of digital media? Well, you don't ever need to resupply, you know, when you run out of paint or your markers go dry or your inks go dry or your color pencils are down to a nub, you need to resupply. But you don't ever run out of any of your paints or markers or colors in digital media. Um, color matching is quick and easy. Uh, this is the best way to color match your fabrics, even better than paint. Because paint you actually have to mix and you might have to add a little bit of this and add a little of that and see and wait for it to dry. Um, a lot of um, sketching apps will have a color matching capability. So all you might need to do is take a picture of the fabric that you're using and use a sort of eyedropper tool or equivalent to match color instantly. Um, so again, you have all the colors at the rainbow of the rainbow at your disposal instantly. Um, and again, with a lot less of the hassle than mixing paint. Um, other pro sketches can be easily duplicated and will not deteriorate over time. So um, with traditional media, um, you know, after a few years, your paper might yellow a little bit, it might get a little faded, depends on how you have to make sure that it doesn't get wet, it might blow away in the wind, or um, who knows what, you might spill spaghetti over it. Um, but not so much with uh, your digital media. It's always going to stay looking beautiful. Um, and also, it's a lot easier. It, it sort of takes away the digitizing step. So most portfolios need to be digitized anyway these, these days. Um, so it kind of takes away, you know, the scanning and optimizing step that you have to do with traditional media when transferring it over into a digital portfolio. So what are the cons to digital media? Because those are some pretty powerful pros. It's not great for those who are digitally savvy. Um, again, if you know apps and tablets and drawing with uh, stylus on, on, on tablets or you're just not good with um, you know downloading apps or using apps or learn it, learning new softwares, it's not going to be for you. Um, some can be very expensive. Um, uh, in addition to, if you, if you are already sort of versed with traditional media, if that's your game, um, it's going to be harder for you to learn. It's going to be, it's, it, you got to learn from the ground up. Um, I don't, I only use digital media when doing technical drawings um, because I learn traditionally. So I kind of am stubborn. I don't want to learn a new thing. <laughs> I do. I leave. I leave the digital me uh, media for my technical sketches, and I'll leave the markers, paints, and colored pencils for my, uh, you know, design sketches. Uh, but that's just me. So again, don't ask me which sketching app I, I like the best because I don't use them. Um, ask your colleagues which sketching apps they like the best. Um, so when are you going to use this? You're going to use it when you're fed up with traditional media. Or, you know, a lot of people, if they're really starting out um, and they haven't um, gained a preference or, or, or learned traditional media in, in a certain aspect or gone down that road far enough, um, might find it a lot easier to use, uh, you know, because if you're going to have to learn one thing, why not learn just learn this? And a lot of people that are digital savvy and prefer uh, doing things online and doing things on a tablet, or not online, but doing things on a tablet or doing things on a computer might find this much easier. Um, another pro I didn't go uh, over is uh, you can you can make mistakes. Um, so it's very hard to erase marker and 
paint and things like that. But for the most part on digital apps, you can erase and, and go back to the beginning and repeal steps and add them back and, and, and make all sorts of mistakes before you reach uh, the final version. So again, these are some options for sketching apps. Again, don't ask me which one I like the best because I haven't used any of them. <laughs> um, so again, maybe I'll make a discussion board for you guys if you guys are really interested in digital media and want to try that instead of the traditional media so you guys can discuss which ones you like the best. Um, and again, some are very expensive. I think some are free. Um, but these I know are at least some options that are a little bit more targeted toward the fashion sketcher as well. Uh, Image Inc, um, Preta Template. You might have heard of Preta Template. They a visit. They're definitely worth a visit to their website. They have a huge, huge archive of croquis. Um, so it's worth it uh, just for there. It's it's an online resource for fashion designers, um, and I guess they have their own uh, fashion sketching app. Um, Procreate, Auto Sketchbook Pro, Sketchbook, and Taya Sui. Uh, is some options, obviously not all of them. There's many, many different sketching apps. So again, if this is something that you're interested in, um, go explore it. Um, if you have uh, a uh, one that you already use, you can certainly keep on using that. Um, and you know, maybe if you if you do have one, um, you know, share it with me and, or with the class and, and and let us know. How do you like it? Why do you like it? Okay, guys. I want to talk now that we've sort of wrapped up our, our digital media, or our, sorry, our, our media, um, but that is not a comprehensive list. Like I said, I use lots of different things, so feel free to experiment. Um, and we'll also even, you know, as we get to it, go over some of the things that I like for very specific fabrics um, uh, that might be non-traditional or a little bit more esoteric uh, in use. But there's one thing I want to do before we go, and that's talk a little bit about line quality. And I'm going to keep it brief, and I'm going to switch over to me. So let me just do that real quick. Hi, guys. So I just want to take a quick note to talk about line quality. Now, line quality... Um, is really important when we're uh, as a fashion sketcher, um, really any illustrator. And we all have our own sort of personality, let's say, when it comes to line quality. Now, what is line quality? So here's a little exercise I want you to do. Um, grab a pen, a marker, or whatever has, whatever you have nearby. And pretend for a minute that you're a famous fashion designer and everybody loves you. Not hard, right? Um, and someone, one of your adoring fans, has come up to you and said, oh my god, I must have your autograph. You're my favorite designer ever. You say, okay. Now what I want you to do is sign an autograph for them. Do your signature. Everyone has a signature. You've done it a hundred times probably. Probably more than that. Here's mine. Okay. It's messy, I know. But that's my signature. My dad told me, make it fast, because you're going to do have to do it a lot. Now, let's take a look at this, and let's take a look at your line quality. So, you've done your signature, I hope. I'll give you another second. Now, take a look at it. There's a flow to it. Some area of the line is going to be a little bit lighter, some is going to be a little bit darker, but it's expressive. And it's the same thing you see in your handwriting. So, everyone has a different handwriting, and um, that is your line quality. And you see it in your signature now, don't you? You see an energy. You see a little bit light, thick. You see how it's very, see how it's very thin and light here, a little bit thicker here, energy going on, um, and it's sort of fading in and out. That's your line quality. And depending on the person, and everyone's is unique, which is fantastic, just like everyone's handwriting is unique, it's just like everyone's signature is unique, everyone's line quality is unique. Um, and that's what I want you to sort of think about and develop as you're sketching, okay? So there are a lot of different types of pens and pencils that can give you different line qualities and sort of exaggerate uh, different types of line qualities. So what happens when we draw? 
as opposed to say when we write something. You know, by now you're probably very, very comfortable with, with writing. You might write really quickly, you might really slowly, but you're not hesitant. Even if sometimes your handwriting is a little bit messy. I wrote very cleanly on my intro, but I'll just do a normal, you know. Little bit of flourishes here and there. I didn't hesitate. Everything's sort of a solid line. And I'm getting a little bit of line quality too. Thicker, thinner in places, a little bit of energy, a little bit of flow. Now, this is what I want you guys to, again, try to think about and try to replicate in your drawing. So what I see a lot, and be sure, keep a look at it uh, for, it, for yourselves, um, in beginner sketching is just the same as you would see in, um, you know, a little kid learning how to do their letters. Um, they're a little bit hesitant, you know? It's a new thing. They're a little bit unsure. Um, you don't know if things are working out. So there's really two things that I see um, in the line quality of beginner sketchers. So I want you guys to be aware of it and try to nip it in the bud when you can. So what I see a lot first is what I call the hairy line. So people will be very, very scared to draw and they'll kind of go little by little and these hairy, hairy lines, um, avoid your hairy, hairy lines. They look unclean, um, they look messy, they're not great, and they really show off your hesitancy um, and, and sort of self-consciousness with your drawing. And we'll see this again when people sort of start to learn their letters. They you know, might kind of stop and, and start and kind of think about it and you kind of get these kind of wiggly, furry, hairy lines. Avoid this um, the best that you can. Um, if that is something that is troubling you, outline first with just a pencil, with one that you can erase very lightly. Get your hairies out of there, okay? And then, Try to step back and see the overall line, and then with your black ink, or whatever you're gonna do your final outline in. Ooh, it's dry, oh no. Give me your final line, and then erase away. You want it nice and smooth and clean. The other thing we kinda see sometimes is a little maybe kind of a little wiggly or, or kind of spotty. And you see that too. Um, and again, that's the same thing as your um, hairy line. I'm just being a little hesitant. Um, and if this is something that, you know, um, you see in your own drawing, don't worry. Um, because just like when we get more familiar with writing our letters as little kids, our handwriting becomes, um, uh, you know, has a better line quality, uh, so will your drawing. When you become a little bit more used to drawing and uh, a little bit more confident um, in yourself and in your sketches, you'll see that in your line quality as well. And what's really cool is the same way as we see our sort of handwriting or our penmanship um, develop into something that's our own, our own unique sort of patterning and our own unique sort of energy that we see, um, so will your drawing. That's where, you know, our individuality um, resides. And um, so really kind of strive to get that to show out. Now just a couple other things about line quality. So not only is it an expression of our personality, we can also use it to express different things about fabric. So let's say I have, you know, a light fluffy fabric, you know, something light and delicate. I want a light and delicate um, line quality. I can have something, you know, I'm gonna use just the sort of tip of this so it's not too heavy. If I have something kind of flowing, I might break it up a little bit and kind of flow it along. So you can barely even see that. Um, but it has a very sort of light, 
flowing quality. Now if I have a very, you know, on the opposite side of that spectrum, if I have a very dark fabric, I'm going to use a heavy, or not dark fabric, but a heavy fabric, I can use a sort of heavier, sharper line to it. We can also vary the line quality thickness in certain areas to sort of give a little bit more energy um, in flow. So if I have drapes of a fabric, let's say I have drapes, let's do just a quick kind of can use that line quality as it sort of trails off or it's thick I, and I can sort of show the kind of flowingness of the fabric. Sorry, there's a glare. Can you see that? So play around with your line quality, see what works for you. And we'll also, when we talk about specific different types of fabric, we'll talk about the importance of line quality um, in those fabrics because our outline um, although it's often looked over, it's really, really important to rendering certain types of fabric. And we'll talk about, you know, what type of line quality to use for those individual fabrics when we get to that. But for right now, try to be confident in your line quality, um, work, and, uh, you know, let your personality shine through. All right, guys. See ya. Bye-bye.